Hello and welcome to this episode of Animasaurus. My name is Kim and today we're going to be looking at White Snake. So this is a bit of a different movie. It came out through doing some research for another project we're working on and one of my colleagues said, oh how about White Snake? Now I hadn't heard of this film before, so I had to go and have a bit of a look at it and check it out and was actually pleasantly surprised at what we found. And is it better than Frozen 2? Now White Snake itself, as a movie, came out internationally released in November 2019. Uh, it came out in January 2019 in China, uh, but it wasn't released internationally until uh, November 2019. Uh, it is a fantasy feature based on a Chinese folk tale, uh, which is commonly called The Legend of the White Snake. Um, the movie itself serves as a prequel to the folk tale. So the production for this film was handled by Warner Brothers Far East and by a company called Light Chaser Animation. Now Light Ch this is actually the fourth animated feature for Light Chaser International. The first film which you might have heard of would be Cats. Now, Cats is very distinctly, when you look at it, you go, oh my goodness, that very much looks like The Secret Life of Pets. Um, and I'll just leave it like that. The, uh, the other one, which, yeah, which you might know, is Little Door Gods. Now, Little Door Gods is actually a really good movie. Definitely check it out if you haven't seen it before. Uh, it's got another, you know, it is another Chinese uh, uh, folk tale, um, but definitely worth checking out. Uh, now... Light Chaser Animation was actually founded by a Chinese internet entrepreneur, Gary Wong, who is the ex-CEO of a company called Tudou.com, which was Chinese answer to YouTube. Uh, and it was founded in 2013. Uh, I kind of find it interesting. Um, I think that this may be like almost a competition to Pearl Studios, um, who are working closely with DreamWorks. So, uh, you know, American company working with the Chinese because they know there's a huge market in China. When it came down to distribution, uh, it was dis uh, distributed through the US and Canada by G Kids. So White Snake was directed by debut directors Zhao G and Amp Wong. Um, now I don't know if they utilise this technology for this film, but when they were doing the Little Door Gods, they were working with a director in the States and he didn't want to have to move to China to actually do the directorial role. So what they managed to actually utilise is a thing called a telepresent robot. Um, now this telepresent robot is basically just an iPad on wheels. So the director could sit in the States and actually go around to everyone's desk and check out what they're doing and for their work. Um, this is utilising technology. Uh, in the production format where you can have your director in another country and still be on the floor talking to the artists and he can see what they're doing and move around within it and he never has to leave the home. Now there's a, couple, a few interesting things since this has already come out. We do know the projected budget for this film was actually only $12 million uh, which is small for a feature production. Um, and it was released, since it was released, it has come up with a box office of 67 million. So return on investment is actually quite good for this film. Um, the, the thing which I do want to mention, which I found quite uh, interesting, especially with the timing that it came out as well, you know, being released in November 2019, is comparisons to uh, Frozen 2. Because um, when we look at it, it's, t uh, its key protagonists are both sisters. So there's two sisters with each other. It's both very much a fantasy based film and there's quite a lot of other comparisons which come between the two which you go, ah, for me it was just a little bit, ah, is it actually better? And well, let's just keep looking and talk about our way through it. Um, so the first thing, first thing for a discussion point is the characters within White Snake. When you look at the characters, they are very clean. Uh, Chinese, definitely got a Chinese authentic when you start looking at the size of their neck and the size of their head um, and they're all very thin and slender um, which is great when you're an animator and you want to get some accentuated poses um, it's good to have some limbs to be able to do that with um, but the head size again if you're looking at heads and eyes it's something that is very much uh, you know the style for uh, China um, 
The, the characters are also, if you look at their skin tone and everything, it's very simplistic. There's not a lot of subsurface scattering within their skin. Um, but it's clean and it goes along with the style. Um, I get big heads, yeah. um, simple, yes. And if you look at their hair as well, if you go back to the way uh, China's hairstyles are done, it's all very like blocky. There's always just a lot of strands all together. Um, which is the style, and it's really nice. I mean, uh, it, it gives it its own style. It doesn't have to be nice. I can say it's not nice. But then we can step onto the environments. Now, the first thing I noticed about the, the environments is they are actually incredibly detailed. They've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort getting this world looking so colorful and rich. Um, like we look at, look at the, the Vista, this one, when I looked at this, the first thing I went to to make comparisons was straight to Kung Fu Panda, because we look at that valley uh, with the mountains in the background, the grass in the front, the flowers and the mist. Uh, and this, I think this one just comes up so much even better than what you see in Kung Fu Panda. So we look at, we look at the characters, or if we compare the characters to the environments then, you can see the characters, there's enough detail in their clothing especially, but if you just look at their faces, uh, they, they don't have the same amount of attention to detail as what you get in, like this one, in the scars and the scratches in the rocks in the background, or the layout of the flowers uh, uh, and the grass on, on the ground. The characters do look fairly plain compared to that, except for their clothes. Um, and that's where the detail kicks in, is back again in their textile of the clothes. Um, uh, water, mist, colours. Uh, like if you look at the colour scheme they've got through, I think through if you watch, well, like when you watch the progression of the movie, their, their colour palette is beautiful and highlighted with the mood that they're trying to get across with the story, so the colours actually flow with the story. Um, you know, I've taken random bits but you look at the colours, blues, go to reds, goes to really dark purples. And when we look at this one here, and we just go, you might be able to kind of pick my comparison again to uh, Frozen 2. The other thing which came across with uh, uh, a comparison with Frozen 2 is fantasy. Um, again, it's another thing that Chinese stories don't back away from, is actually including fantasy elements, and they let the audience actually go off on this fantasy tangents. Like Mary Poppins floating away in an umbrella, being magically carried away on a magic umbrella. Um, or just going, you know, white and yellow dragons and demons actually fighting in the sky. Not something you'll find in Western culture that often, which is why when you actually, when you get into these stories and you get taken away by the folklore that goes into these stories, it's really exhilarating and very exciting to see what they can bring out. Whoa! If you like dragons, make sure you smash that like button. How often, you know, how often do we actually see things like dragons? Um, and humans actually falling in love with each other. Um, not very often. But, you know, to draw comparisons to this as well, I made the comparison between DreamWorks before. Uh, Abominable, again, it came across from the Middle Kingdom, it, it hit the cinemas, and it didn't have a great reaction. And a lot of the storytelling and, um, you know, fantasy elements which were in Abominable, Abominable come across into Whitesnake as well, which is why uh, another reason which it doesn't get quite the grand uh, reception in the US that it does in China. Um, different storytelling. But the thing that really did stand out with this movie um, is the cinematography. They've gone for a very, you know, it's definitely made for a widescreen, uh, cinema, cinemascopic widescreen. But we look at the, um, so they've made it for a cinemascopic widescreen, which gives it extra width. And they've utilized it quite, quite a lot. One thing I didn't dig that much is the amount of real intense close-ups which we get. Um, I mean, this is when you do go, oh, you can see the detail from the, the dragon. You can see her scales in her forehead and the scales which are produced, protruded from her face and her eyes which have changed to a dragon's eyes. But the amount of these intense close-ups you get is really quite jarring and they don't lead you in and they do that for the visceral reaction, which I, I don't dig that much. I, I kind of like to be back a bit further without quite as much intense close-ups as what we get. Um, 
they do do a really good job of leading your eye through the action with these intense close-ups. Um, you can see via the pin coming through her face and her ducking out the way. But it's again, it's when you get down to choice, it's something that they actually include. Um, the darkness which comes through, like when they're driving action, they always lead your action through the shot really, really well. Um, again, great cinema, great cinematography to actually lead your eye so you don't get lost. Um, and pushing wide lenses, like this one, like this shot here, they've really gone for a wide lens looking up at the character in the drenching rain. Like, there's CG doesn't step away from rain that much anymore. Uh, listening to a, uh, a tech talk uh, on um, the Blue Umbrella, and they were saying that the, the rain, the, the, the idea, the idea and the tech they were using behind uh, creating rain in the blue umbrella was the, still the same sort of rain they were trying to produce uh, right back from Toy Story. So, and you know, again, this is not has absolutely nothing to do with Pixar at all. But rain is very much straightforward. But getting characters to look wet in the rain and having rain interact with characters is a different story. Again, they're leading, you know. The, the way they use their widescreen and actually capture your eye with light is really pretty as well. And just actually going for a top-down look on a fight. You know, this is really great cinematography. You go back to a lot of Kung Fu movies, you'll get this sort of stuff as well. But it's really nice to see in animation. Uh, close and distance, like we're following with an object, like a small object as we, we, we track the camera tracks with it as it's spinning and being thrown. Great use of the camera and great use of the technology to be, or great use of the media, I should say. Technology. Great use of the media, being able to get the camera to travel along with such a tiny object. Beautiful. And this sort of shot is one which really I, I like coming back to as well. There's two of them right at the end here I just want to bring out. You look at the distance, they've not shied away from actually putting, using their wide screen to its full potential by putting the characters right on the edge and creates that distance between them. Even though this is very much a confrontation image and a confrontation shot, you can see the distance between them. They've got their lines going through the shot, you've got the uh, the, the ground plane, you've got the trees which create another line, then you've still got the mountains in the background which are creating depth in the image. Uh, you've got the scaffolding on the one side to balance off the second character on the other side. So this frame, I just kind of geek out over this and I love this frame, as well as the next one. When you look at this one, I think this one, I could quite happily have this painted on my wall. I really love this one. It's going to be my desktop image for quite a while. Um, but I really do dig this image. Just, you know, framing up perfectly with the moon in the background and the two characters over top of the moon weighted over the dark building on the other side of the image. Ah, uh, yeah, I geek out over this. I love it. Um, and it's, again, another great use of the width of this frame. So thank you for going through Whitesnake with me. Leave your comments down below. Who's seen it? Who's going to see it? Are you going to see it now that I've recommended it? And until the next time we're flying through the air in fantasy land, my name is Kim. You're watching Animasaurus.